I want to welcome everybody to our worship service this morning. For those of you guys that are visiting with us, welcome. For those of you guys that are members of the church here, welcome back. For those of you folks that are online, thank you for choosing to join us this morning. If you would, let's stand for our first song. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies through his beloved Son. Strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty power. Who in the strength of Jesus trusts. Who in the strength of Jesus trusts is more than conqueror. Stand then in his great might, with all his strength in dune. But take to arm you for the fight. But take to arm you for the fight, the panoply of God. Leave no unguarded place, no weakness of the soul. Take every virtue, every grace. Take every virtue, every grace, and fortify the whole. That having all things done and all your conflicts past, you may or come through Christ alone. You may or come through Christ alone and stand entire at last. Father, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. In all the earth, Spirit, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the strengthens thee. 
I am the Lord that strengthens thee. I am the Lord that strengthens thee. So be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, thank you for this time we come together and worship. Thank you for everyone that's able to be here today, and please be with those people that aren't able to be here. And please do a blessing on them and help us to encourage them as well. Thank you for all the ministries of this church and suit a blessing on them. Uh, may we be encouraged and encourage others. And th may we lift up the name of Jesus to draw everyone near. Be with us as we worship today and through the week. In Jesus' name, amen. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go, anywhere he leads me in this world below, anywhere without him dearest joys would fade, anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid, anywhere, anywhere fear I cannot know, anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not alone. Other friends may fail me, he is still my own. Though his hand may lead me over drearest ways, anywhere with Jesus is a house of praise. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus over land and sea, telling souls in darkness of salvation free. Ready as he summons me to go or stay. Anywhere with Jesus when he points the way. Anywhere, anywhere, Fear I cannot know, anywhere with Jesus I can safely go, anywhere with Jesus I can go to sleep, when the darkening shadows round about me creep, knowing I shall waken nevermore to roam, anywhere with Jesus will be home sweet home. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot go. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Good morning, church. In regards to this table, I'm going to read a portion of scripture from the second chapter of Titus, verse 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness, worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope that is the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do good. At the Lord's table, we meet in memory of a dying Savior and a living Lord. On the first day of the week, all over the world, the faithful gather to meet at Jesus at his table and rejoin in an exalted time 
of fellowship as we remember his sacrifice for us. 1 Corinthians 11:26 reads, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come again. And to the believer, these are precious words that must never be forgotten. As we meet in remembrance, we must never forget Jesus and the system of redemption that he installed. Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection formed a platform of faith in the gospel that we love. And it is Christ's gospel. Christ is the heart, and he is the center of it. The church is his body. He gave his life to purchase it, and he gives life and purpose to the church for us. We count it as a joy and a privilege to meet at his table each week and displays our spiritual nature before God. When Jesus paid the ultimate price for our redemption, and we partake of this at this table of faith, and our faith should be renewed and revived. We meet weekly to keep his memory alive. Is this important? Once again, John said in 653, and Jesus said unto them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in yourselves. For the faithful believer, this table is a lifeline to eternity. Let us give thanks for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for Jesus, who willingly gave up, gave up his life on the cross and died that we might have life. And as we partake of this emblem, we pray that we do so in a manner that is acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us give thanks. Father, I accept our thanks for this fruit of the vine which Jesus gave to represent his blood shed on the cross for the remission of our sins. And again, Father, as we partake of this, let us do so in a pleasing manner. And again, in Jesus' name we pray. The early church took up a gathering for the work of the church and the supplying of, of the needy. Before COVID, we used to pass a collection plate around. Now we have a receptacle up the top of the stairs to give. give. We give for the work and the expenses of this congregation. Give it, giving is an act of God that is is pleasing to him, in an act of worship that is pleasing to God. Giving blesses the giver as well as the receiver. Giving is a way to ex express our gratitude and trust in our God, who in reality is the source and owner of everything we have. Let us give thanks. Father, we thank you for your blessings, including our blessings as Jesus as our Savior, Bless us as we return a portion of our blessings back to you for the benefit of his kingdom and as we lay up treasure in heaven. We ask this prayer of thanksgiving in the name of Jesus. Amen. Long before the lesson this morning, ancient words. <clears throat> Holy words, long preserved for our walk in this world. They 
resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope. Give us strength, help us cope in this world where'er we roam. Ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart holy words of our faith handed down to this age came to us through sacrifice oh heed the faithful words of christ holy words long preserved for our walk in this world they resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Just kidding. One more song and then we'll have John. If you would please stand for the singing of We Bow Down. Carrie, your shirts are killing me. I, I love it. <laughs> Make sure you come and see these guys' shirts later on, <clears throat> especially the gentlemen. <laughs> you are Lord of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heavens before there was time, and Lord of all lords you will be. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. Lord of all, Lord, you will be. You are king of creation and king of my life, king of the land and the sea. You were king of the heavens before there was time, and king of all kings you will be. We bow down, and we crown you the king. We bow down, and we crown you the king. We bow down, and we crown you the king. King of all kings you will be. Please be seated. I will be reading from Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that, he, that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds not giving up his meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching.
I would welcome the children to come up and we'll do a song together. Children and their attending adults, <laughs> which is good. Wonderful. Who did make the fishy swim, fishy swim, fishy swim? Who did make the fishy swim? God in heaven above. Who did make the flowers grow? Flowers grow, flowers grow. Who did make the flowers grow? God in heaven above. Who did make the birdies fly? Birdies fly, birdies fly. Who did make the birdies fly? God in heaven above, who did make both you and I, you and I, you and I, who did make both you and I, God in heaven above, who did make the fishy swim, flowers grow, birdies fly, who did make both you and I, God in heaven above. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> good morning, everyone. It's good to see you today. I decided to wear my tie with wildlife on it this morning. Um, on Friday and Saturday, Jane and I and, and Margaret had the opportunity to go out to uh, the Broken Arrow Youth Ranch where Howard and Karen work. And uh, so we, we traveled there and back and uh, got a visit there. Uh, got to see Dwight and Ruth Quiring as well who are uh, training to do respite care. Uh, for Howard and Karen every now and then, so it was, it was good to see them there as well. And uh, I always like that drive. Beautiful scenery, uh, lots of wildlife, um, lots of herds of cattle and deer, like herds of deer, uh, many deer. And uh, fortunately, none of them were on the highway right in front of my vehicle. They were off to the side, Carrie, so I was safe. So that was good. But it's, uh, it's always refreshing to uh, get out and uh, see another part of uh, the world that God has made and to enjoy the beauty of it. And, uh, and it's good to be here this morning with all of you and to praise God. Uh, we bow down and we worship the King. I love that song. And love the spirit of, of worship that we can engage in together. Today's lesson uh, is about worship. Uh, I'm preparing, as you, as you probably know, to be away next Sunday. I'll be delivering three lessons at the Carmen Lectures in Manitoba. So that's where Jane and I will be. And, uh, and it, the theme of the Carmen Lectureship is, We Wish to See Jesus... And I was really pleased when I saw that was the theme and, uh, and that I could do three lessons that were uh, on that theme. And the particular lesson that, uh, that I am going to preview this morning, I've done some background uh, study to prepare for one of my lessons on Jesus-centered worship. Jesus-centered worship. And so uh, that's why we had Jeremy read from this passage in Hebrews this morning. And, uh, and actually, I've, I've uh, handed out uh, 
most of you will have gotten this, maybe not all of you, but I handed out a sheet of paper with today's reading on it. Uh, you'll see that uh, Jeremy read from the New International Version, which is on the bottom of this page, and, uh, and I've printed it also from the New Revised Standard Version, which is uh, what I normally preach, uh, what I preach from usually. So anyways, what I want you to do, we're going to identify this morning seven words for better worship, okay? Now, I, times have changed a little bit. When I was growing up, we, we used to circle things in our Bibles, circle things and underline things, and, uh, and I have Bibles on my shelf that are uh, tattered and torn and written all over the place, things written in the margin and stuff circled and underlined and all of that stuff. Not everybody likes to do that to their Bible, so I thought maybe I should print a sheet of paper and then you can circle these things on a sheet of paper. And, and the other problem is that uh, some of you probably have uh, screens that you're looking at the Scriptures on, your, your phone, and uh, it doesn't work as well to circle it on your, on your screen and then you scroll up and the circle's in the wrong place. So anyways, I recommend you do it on the, on the sheet of paper instead of on your screen. Although, if your digital version of the Bible is like mine, you can highlight things, right? And save them as notes or as highlights. So that might work. But what I want to, us to begin with this morning is, uh, and, and uh, uh, I didn't hand out pens, so you, you have to find something to do that with, uh, or maybe you'll just remember where all of these things are. There's seven words in this passage that uh, I identified as being important to worship, to our worship as Christians. And I want us to uh, identify those words, and, uh, and I want us to just uh, focus on those for a few minutes this morning. All of th these words will help to enhance our, our understanding and our participation and our benefit from, participation, from participating in worship. So here we go. In verse 19... Find the word confidence, okay, confidence, okay, in verse 19, and circle that word. Since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary, okay, so you can circle it in one or both of the places there, uh, that's the word that appears in both of those renditions, okay, that's in verse 19. Then in verse 21, Circle the words, the word approach, or if you have the NIV or another translation, it might say uh, draw near, okay, it might say draw near, or some equivalent depending what translation you use. Approach or draw near, circle that word in verse 22. Also in verse 22 is the word true. Approach with a true heart. Or if you have the NIV, it's the word sincere. Draw near with a sincere heart. Circle that word sincere or true. We're going to spend a few moments understanding what that means. And then also in that verse 22, it says with a true heart in full assurance of faith. And I want you to circle the word, well, I circled the, both the word full and assurance. Full assurance. Full assurance. The NIV says, with the full assurance that brings faith. Okay. Then in verse 23, hold fast or hold unswervingly. Circle that. Hold fast. That's actually a single word in, in the original language. Or hold unswervingly to the confession of our hope. Okay? Uh, without wavering. 
I think actually in the NIV that phrase, uh, in the NRSV and the NIV, that idea of without wavering uh, should be there. Uh, I think in the NIV it uses the word unswervingly, hold unswervingly, and in, other, in, my, in the translation I speak from it says hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. And that phrase, without wavering, is a part of that word. It's a single word that means hold fast without wavering, or unswervingly is a good, is a good word. Okay, in verse 24, circle, circle the word provoke or spur. Um, provoke one another, or the NIV says to spur one another on. You could, you could circle that whole phrase, spur one another on, or provoke one another. And we'll talk about what that means. It doesn't mean, you know, get under each other's skin. That's, that's not what it means. So we, we, need, we do need to talk about that and understand what it is. And then in verse 25, in verse 25, circle the word encouraging. Encouraging one another. Encouraging. Okay, encouraging one another. All right. So I'm going to read the passage again, and I want you to see all of these words that you've circled, or to hear them as I read them, in context again. And I'm going to read from the New Revised Standard. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is His flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So that first word that I had you circle was the word confidence in verse 19. Uh, Paresia is the Greek word. Um, it, it means to speak, uh, the confidence to speak freely and without fear. That's in particular what it, uh, what it means in this context. The emphasis for worship is boldness. It's the boldness that we should have, first of all, in the presence of God, unafraid to say to God what is on our hearts, unafraid of God. We, we don't come in uh, into this assembly or to any assembly or even uh, if we gather with a few in, in, in a house or if we are going to approach God alone in prayer, we do not need to be afraid when we go to worship God. We should be able to come to Him with boldness because of what Jesus Christ has done, because uh, we can enter the sanctuary by the blood of Christ. That's such a, a beautiful thought. We can enter the sanctuary by the blood of Christ. It's not like we have to tiptoe in, and I hope he doesn't notice I'm there, and I hope I don't make a mistake. And no, with boldness, we can go to our heavenly Father because of what Jesus has done. But the other part of, of this boldness or this confidence that's important for us is unafraid to proclaim our faith before others. It's, it's boldness in the presence of God, but it's also confidence and boldness before others. 
Okay, I don't, I don't have to be ashamed to say out loud for others to hear, to sing, and to shout, to express, to say amen, to lift up my prayer, and for people to see and to know that uh, I am a believer and a worshiper of God. And the reason why I can do that with boldness is, again, because Jesus Christ has, by His blood, opened up the way for me to do that. There's two verses that I, I think are interesting in the book of Acts. Acts 4 and verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness, this is the same word, in Acts 4.13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. They saw the boldness of Peter and John. That's that same. We, we should have that same boldness if we're following Hebrews here that Peter and John had. It's not a personality thing. It's a Jesus has done this for us thing, okay? He's made it so that we can be bold, so we can have confidence in the presence of God. And then Acts 4, verses 29 to 31, and this is the prayers, uh, this is the, the people in Jerusalem, the prayers of the church as they're praying during this time of persecution they were under. And now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal. Signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. That's twice in that passage, that word is used. It wasn't just Peter and John that had boldness. These people prayed to God, and the Spirit of God filled the place where they were and filled the people who were praying to God, and they were filled with boldness. We need to pray for that. Not just because we can speak to God with boldness, but so that we would be filled with the confidence to speak on behalf of God with boldness, to be able to share the message of Jesus with others with boldness. We can do that because of what Jesus has done. So that's the word confidence in verse 19 from Hebrews 10. Then in verse 22, it uses the word approach, and I had you circle that word, approach, or, or draw near, and that is literally what the word means. The emphasis for worship is getting close to God, getting close to God, being comfortable in His presence, being intimate with God, not not having God as a distant relationship, but having God as a close relationship, as an intimate one. You know, this, this adds to the significance of the Lord's Supper being central uh, to our worship. And again, it, it's based on the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why we can be intimate with God. Sinful creatures that we are, we can have a closeness to God because of the cleansing power of Jesus' blood. So there's a couple of things about our worship that I want us to take notice of. One is, is that we observe the Lord's Supper as a central part of our worship. Um, we do other things as well, but the whole reason why we dare to lift the Lord's name in prayer, in prayer and in song, the whole reason why we expect to come and, and, and bring to God our sins and, 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 and trust that He forgives us of our sins, 
The whole reason why we come to, to hear His Word and expect to hear from Him and, and, and for His Spirit to, to work in our hearts and transform our lives. The whole reason why we gather in worship and expect any benefit from it and expect that God will receive and accept anything that, that happens as we participate in worship is because of the blood of Jesus Christ, which has opened the way for us to draw near, for us to approach God. It's very, very special what Jesus has done. You notice that when we offer prayers, most of the time you'll hear the person who offers the prayer, just before they say the, the final amen, they'll say, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. A desperate sinner crying out to his Creator may certainly pray to God without knowing Jesus or using His name. But we who are redeemed in the blood of Jesus understand that we pray to ask forgiveness we seek divine strength and healing, and we offer thanksgiving and praise knowing that our Heavenly Father receives and responds to us because of what Jesus has done. There wouldn't be any reason to ask for forgiveness if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus Christ. There wouldn't be really any reason to ask for, God, dear God, strengthen us as your church and, and heal us where, where we are broken, and there wouldn't be any reason to pray that way if it wasn't for what Jesus has done. Or even to offer thanksgiving and praise and expect that God receives that from us. We do expect that He receives that from us because of what Jesus Christ has done. And so when we pray... Whatever our prayer is, whether it's a prayer of confession and repentance, or it's a prayer of thanksgiving and praise, or it's a, a prayer of request and, and uh, you know, asking for things, we pray that prayer always in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, because we understand that it's because of what Jesus did at the cross. It's because of the blood of Jesus Christ that we can come to Him in prayer. Hebrews 4 and verse 16 says this, let us then approach, and this is the same word by the way, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence and there's our word confidence again, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. You may have come for this time of worship to see some people that you care about or who care about you or to spend time in God's Word. And it should be that way when we gather together. Those things should be part of the reason why we want to be here and why we come. I want to be with you, and you, you want to be with me, and, and we want to be together, and we want to lift each other up and encourage each other, and we want to open the Scriptures, and we want to learn something together, and we want to grow. But most of all, our reason for coming to worship is so that we can approach God. So that together, as His children, we can join our hearts, we can join our hands, and we can turn our faces towards our Heavenly Father and approach Him. Oh, it's Again, it's, it's good to be together. It's good to, to have the Scriptures with us and to learn something here. But we can, do, we can do that over and over and over again. 
and still stay far away. God doesn't want us to stay far away. He wants us to draw near to Him, to approach His throne of grace and receive blessing and grace from Him. That's an important reason why we would gather for worship. Verse 22 also uses that word true, which we circled. It's the word aleth, alethanos. And it has some variations of meaning, all of which I believe are at play here. If something is true or sincere, as the word might be, sometimes this word is used to mean not fictitious. Something is true as opposed to being fictitious or made up or pretend. Another meaning of this word when it says true means not imitation. Okay, it's the real thing. It's not, a, it's not an imitation. It's not something that's done to, to, to be a copy of something else, but it's the real thing. And another meaning of this word is not incomplete. You know, if something is true or sincere, it doesn't mean it's just, okay, uh, I've given part, but I haven't given it all yet. Well, this word true means giving it all, complete, total, and sincere. And so when, when we see it in this context, let us hold, uh, sorry, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance. It means to, uh, to be genuine and transparent before God. You know, don't come... Uh, as a shield against, well, I'm, I'm going to go worship and cover up uh, everything that's, that's going wrong with me. I'll, I'm, I'm going to go to worship and pretend everything is good. Well, actually, that's kind of the opposite of what we should do. We should come to worship and bear it all before God. And we should be very open and, and let him in. Draw near to God with a true heart in full assurance. And so that's the other word we circled. I can't even pronounce the word in Greek, so I'm not going to. <laughs> Are you okay with that? But in full assurance. The emphasis is for worship in strengthening faith with certainty and insurance, shrinking our doubt and growing our assurance is an important part of worship while we are gathered together in God's presence. I like what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 5, where he says, because our message of the gospel came to you, not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, with full conviction, that's, that's this same word that in our verse in Hebrews is full assurance. With full conviction, just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake. What we know about God and life and spiritual things, what we know about God and those things, needs to move from here to here. It needs to, it needs to become a conviction, not just something that, that we know. Yeah, I know God. I, I know who Jesus is. I know about the church. I, you know, I, uh, I know about worship. I know about the Lord's Supper. I know about baptism. Uh, I know about Jesus' miracles. I know the history in the Old Testament. I, I know all these things. 
Well, at some point, what we know needs to move from what we know to what we're convicted of. We need to be moved by what we know. And that's, that's what this word is about. It's about having that full assurance and conviction about what we know. And so then in verse 23, it uses the word hold fast when it says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Let us hold fast. Literally means to hold tightly and securely, either to restrain something or to keep something safe. The emphasis for worship is solidifying our understanding and conviction of what we believe, not just so that we don't lose it, but also to take a stronger and more personal ownership of it. If I had a, if I had a pet dog, I would have brought this with me, but I, I don't have one. Sorry, I don't have one. It was too late at night to call somebody who does to bring one this morning. But I remember what it was like when uh, my family growing up, we had a, we had a, 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 we just had one pet dog ever while I was growing up. Her name was Duchess. Beautiful uh, dog, a, a, a Sheltie miniature Coley. And I, I loved taking our dog for a walk, you know, you know uh, up and down the streets of Dauphin, Manitoba, where we lived. And event, later, when mom and dad moved to Estevan, Saskatchewan, um, I used to take Duchess for a walk on a leash. Now, why do you put, why do you put your, your dog on a leash? Why do, why do we do that when we take our dog for a walk? So, so she doesn't run away, okay? That's, that's, one of the, that's one of the biggest important reasons. It's a restraint, right? We need, we need to restrain our dog for various reasons. I mean, Duchess was never going to hurt anybody. Um, she was a beautiful dog and a very gentle, spirited dog, and we didn't want to lose her. I didn't want her to run off into traffic. I didn't want her to to chase after something that caught her attention, and then I not be able to get her back. And so it was really important to me that she, that, that when we went for a walk together, she was, she was on that leash, and we would go for a walk. But there were a couple of other things about that that was also really important. I remember, and this was fun, I, I, was, just a, I was just in junior high when, when we, we got Duchess. As, as our family pet. And I remember taking Duchess for a walk in our neighborhood where we lived, and, uh, and all of a sudden, at the, at the end of the street, around the corner, comes these, these three girls that I went to school with, and was like, oh no, you know, they, they were, you know, uh, three girls that I didn't speak to because I didn't think they would want to hear from me. You know what? I, you understand what I'm saying? They intimidated me. Okay, they were they were they were the the pretty girls in my class, and I was just a, as a as a junior high kid, I was a little bit afraid of them, you know. But as I'm walking towards them, they looked and they saw Duchess, and they're like, oh, "What a beautiful dog you have!" And they came and they petted. Them. And of course, Duchess was such a beautiful, gentle creature, and she. She let them, you know, fawn over her and pet her and everything. And how long have you had her? And, they, and I had this conversation with these three girls that had never spoken to me before. And it was, uh, it was really important and special to me that this was my dog, right? All of a sudden, it became really important to me that Duchess belonged to me. And that became something important about taking Duchess for a walk on the leash. 
was it was also a way, it became that for me, it was also a way of letting everybody know, this is my dog, right? She belongs to me. I mean, she's the family pet, yes, but they're at home doing what they're doing. Duchess came with me for a walk. And there was a, a bond, you know, that, that grows between you and your pet when you take them for a walk. Okay, now I hope you don't think this is a petty example. Sorry for the pun. But in a way, that's the significance of what this phrase means to hold on to the confession of our faith. Part of the reason why you need to be here, you need to engage in worship here or somewhere regularly, is you need to take your faith for a walk. Think about that for a moment. Regularly. You need to regularly bring out those things that you believe about God and about the Scriptures, about your Creator, about the life He has given you, about the world that you live in that belongs to Him, and you need to own that. That, need to be, that needs to become yours. Not just a family pet. You know, I was raised going to church. I was raised in a home where we prayed before every meal, where mom read a Bible story to us before we went to bed, where we attended all the services of the church. But at some point, God needed to become mine, not just my family's thing. The faith of my parents was great, and they did a good job of passing faith down to me, but it was important for me to take ownership of that faith for myself, for, not, for me to not just lean on the faith of my parents, of my family. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? That faith needed to become my faith, my faith. I needed to be able to, 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 to go out into the world without mom and dad and for people to see that this is my faith, this is what I believe, this is who I am, not just who my family is. And yeah, I'm, I'm a member of this family. Worship is a way in which we can publicly, which we can verbally, which we can openly bring out our faith. You know, we, we sing the, some of, a lot of the same songs over and over again. Why do we do that? We read. How many times have I preached from this scripture? Somebody's probably counting. From this passage in Hebrews 10, over and over again. Why do we keep reading the Word of God? Why do we keep praying a lot of the same things in our prayers? Why do we, why on a week after week after week basis, take the bread and the fruit of the vine to remember the body and blood of Jesus? We do that because this is our faith that we need to express. And in worship, it's, we bring it out before God and before the world and say, this is who I am. It reminds us who we are. It reminds us who we belong to. We take ownership. It moves as I said before, from something that we know to something that we believe and then something that we are. And that's where our Christian faith needs to go. And worship helps us get there. And when we, 
we don't worship, when we neglect worship, those things crumble away. We start to forget who we are. We start to feel less convicted about the things that we know. We start to feel less confident about our relationship with God. Worship keeps that alive and not just keeps it alive, but makes it strong and helps us grow. And then in verse 24 is that word for provoke or to spur one another on. And actually this word is used in a lot of ways in the New Testament. It means to consider something very carefully. It means to concentrate on something, to closely examine something. It doesn't just exclusively mean to, to push something and to provoke something in the way that we think of that. And so the emphasis for worship is the idea, of, and, and this passage is talking about that we need to spur one another on as we see the day approaching and not neglect meeting together. The idea is, is that in worship we're going to be interacting with each other, showing attention and care for what we see as needs. I fellowship with you, do works of service and ministry with you, worship together with you, because I want to be spurred on by you. That's why I, I worship with you. I want to be spurred on by you. I want the company of good people in the presence of God to rub off on me and make me a better person. If we are not together, then that does not happen. But the more I am with you intentionally in the presence of our common Lord, the better I become as a person. The better I become as a person. Never think this, uh, and I know sometimes we do, and I say that because sometimes I have thought this way. Never think, well, I don't feel good enough to be with these people. I don't feel very good about myself, so I'm just going to stay home. Uh, I don't belong there with these people. Don't think that way. When I don't feel good enough, is when I need to be with you people the most. When you don't feel good enough is when you need to be with the people of God in the presence of our common Lord the most. That's when you need to be there. So in verse 25, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Encourage. That word is used 109 times in the New Testament. The Greek word, parakaleo, the, it, it, the verb. It's not translated encourage all the time. And so I want to let you know what some of the other meanings of that word are and how it's used. For instance, in Matthew 5, Jesus says, Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, that's not the only place where it's translated that way. It's translated that way in a lot of other places. Sometimes the encouragement that we need to receive is to be comforted because we're struggling with something, we're hurting, we feel defeated, we're discouraged, and we need to be comforted. We need to be comforted or we need to give comfort. Sometimes that's what the word encourage means. In Luke chapter 3, it says that John the Baptist exhorted the people with many words as he proclaimed the gospel. He exhorted 
the people. It uses this word, parakaleo, for exhorted the people. It's the same as in Acts 2, when people exhorted the people to save themselves by obeying the gospel of Jesus. So it has to do also with teaching. Sometimes that's the kind of encouragement I need, is teaching. I need to be exhorted with the Word of God. Sometimes it means just simply to plead or implore. Like in Mark chapter 1, a leper begged Jesus to heal him. And and it's this verb again. It isn't just that he encouraged Jesus to make him feel better. It's that he was pleading with Jesus, begging him, I beseech you to heal me. And, and, And it's used that way many, many times in the New Testament. And sometimes that's what we need as well when we come together. We need to talk to each other about what we need and to implore each other. And then sometimes the word is invite. And for me, the classic example of that is when the Ethiopian in Acts chapter 8 invited Philip to join him in the chariot. Come up into the chariot with me. I'm reading this passage from the scriptures and I don't understand who it's talking about. Um, Come and explain it to me. And he invited him. This this word, parakaleo, encourage. So how are we going to apply that? Sometimes it means comfort someone who is struggling with some kind of heartache or suffering. Exhort someone with an open heart to act upon their faith and obey the gospel. Or implore someone to repent of some misdirection in their life, or plead with someone you trust for help when you are in the place of need. Invite someone to study the Bible with you, or to pray with you, or simply to deepen your fellowship in the Lord. And of course, encourage each other with kind deeds, positive attitudes, and words of thanks. All of these words that are used in Hebrews chapter 10 In the context of worship, the more we learn about them, the more we understand why it's so important for us to be together this morning and be together with other Christians in other places and at other times as we have opportunity in the presence of God at His throne, at His feet in worship together, because these are the things that happen when we worship God. Know Jesus more in 2024. land of parting, losing and leaving, far beyond the crosses, darkening this, and far beyond the taking and the bereaving, lies a summer land of bliss, land beyond so fair and bright, land beyond where is no night. Summer land, God is its light. Oh, happy summer land of bliss. Beyond this land of toiling, sowing and reaping. Far beyond the shadows, darkening this. And far beyond the sighing, moaning and weeping. Lies a summer land of bliss, land beyond so fair and bright, land beyond where is no night, summer land, God is its light, oh happy summer land of bliss, beyond this land of waiting, 
seeking and sighing, far beyond the sorrows, darkening this, and far beyond the pain and sickness and dying, lies the summer land of bliss, land beyond so fair and bright, land beyond where is no night, summer land, God is its light, oh happy summer land of bliss. Let's pray. Dear God, we come to you now as we conclude our worship, and we thank you for the opportunity we've had to be here to worship you, to uh, sing songs of praise to you, to partake of the Lord's Supper, to listen to a message. And God, we just ask that you'll be with us as we go our ways this week. Help us to be lights in this community and the communities that we live in. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.